Every year during Holy Week, on Good Friday, the church reads the entire Passion narrative from the Gospel according to St. John. And every year when I hear that narrative read, there's one particular part of John's Passion narrative that really leaps out at me. And it's the account of the death of Christ and the piercing of His side with a spear. Uh, so what I want to do in this video is just take a moment to look at that one element, the piercing of the side of Christ and the flowing out of the blood and water, and ask ourselves, what is the meaning of that episode? What is the meaning of that event? Why does John highlight it? And what would it have meant in a first century Jewish context? How can it help us to understand better the mystery of Jesus' crucifixion and the mystery of His death? So let's look at that passage together for just a minute. It's in John chapter 19, verse 31 through 37. And it's only John's gospel that tells us about the piercing of the side of Christ. So this is unique to his account of the Passion narrative. This is what he says. Since it was a day of preparation, in order to prevent the bodies from remaining on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came, and they broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. And at this moment, John interrupts his gospel. He does something he rarely does, or never does anywhere else. He interrupts the gospel, and he steps into the narrative and says, he who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth that you may also believe. In other words, what he's saying here is, he who saw this is, is telling you the, the blood and the water, the piercing of the side of Christ really happened. That is the truth, right? And then he goes back to the story. Verse 36, For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled, not a bone of him shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. So let's stop there. What then is the meaning of the piercing of Jesus' side in the Gospel of John and the flowing out of blood and water? And why does the author interrupt the Gospel in order to emphatically you know, insist that he really saw this and that it really happened? Uh, and what would it admit in a first century Jewish context? Well, I would like to suggest in this video just three, at least three meanings. Actually, it's like multiple layers of meaning, virtually everything in the Gospel of John. But in this case, I want to suggest three key meanings. Number one, that Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophecy of the pierced Messiah from Zechariah. Number two, that Jesus is the new Adam. And number three, that Jesus is a new temple. So let's look at each one of those in turn. The first one, the primary meaning of the blood and water from the side of Christ, John himself tells us when he says that these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled, they shall look upon him whom they have pierced. Now when he says that, he's quoting the book of Zechariah, chapter 12, uh, verse 10. And in that passage, what Zechariah is describing is this mysterious figure of the, the shepherd who is pierced, he's, uh, which came in later times to be interpreted as an image of the Messiah, the shepherd of the people, the future king of Israel. But what's interesting about Zechariah is when he says that about the piercing of this mysterious figure, he also says something else. He says this, quote, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of compassion and supplication, so that when they look on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weeps bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn son. And then he goes on to say, On that day there shall be a fountain open for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from their sin and their uncleanness. So the first point that John is making here is that Jesus is the pierced Messiah of the book of Zechariah. He's the mysterious one whom they have pierced. And when he is pierced, on that day, Zechariah said, a fountain would be open for the inhabitants of Jerusalem and Judea to cleanse them from their sins. So the first meaning of the blood and water is that John sees the blood and the water coming from the side of Christ as the fountain that is going to wash away 
the sins of the people, that's going to cleanse them from their sins. So this is the atoning character of Jesus' death. But I think there's actually more going on here. Because another theme in John's Gospel that he's emphasized over and over again is the identity of Jesus as the bridegroom and as the one who's going to bring in a new creation, as the new Adam, so to speak. And if you have that image in mind, there's a second layer of meaning. Because when John describes Jesus dying and then the blood and the water coming from the, the side of the dead Christ, any first century Jew would have thought also back, not just to Zechariah, but to the book of Genesis and to the story of the creation of Adam, the first man and the first bridegroom. So if you go back to the book of Genesis, chapter 2, verse 21 through 24, what do we find? Well, we find that in Genesis 2, the way God makes the first woman, who goes on to be called Eve, is from the flesh of the side of Adam. So this is what it says, Genesis 2, 21. It says, The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, Adam, Adam. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and he coasted up its place with flesh. And the rib which the Lord had taken from the man, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. And then the man said, This at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife, and they become one flesh. All right, so you might be thinking, well, wait, what does that have to do with Jesus in the Gospel of John? He doesn't say anything about Jesus' rib, uh, but it's a little clearer here in Hebrew, because when the, your English Bible says, while he slept, God took one of his ribs, in the Hebrew, it literally says, while he slept, he took one of his sides. So it's the, the woman is taken from the side of the man. It, literally, the side which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her fr to the man. And then they are married as the first husband and wife, the first man and woman, Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 2. So um, since ancient times, early Christian writers saw another level of meaning. They saw Christ on the cross as the divine bridegroom and therefore the new Adam. Listen to the words of the great 4th century uh, saint and doctor of the church, St. Augustine. This is what he had to say in his uh, commentary on the crucifixion of Jesus. He says, quote, Adam foreshadowed Christ. And as Adam was a type of Christ, so too was the creation of Eve from the sleeping Adam, a prefiguration of the creation of the church from the side of the Lord as he slept. For as he suffered and died on the cross and was struck by a lance, the sacraments which formed the church flowed forth from him. By Christ sleeping, we also are to understand his passion. As Eve came from the side of the sleeping Adam, so the church was born from the side of the suffering Christ. That's Augustine's Exposition on the Psalms, 138.2. So notice what Augustine is saying. Just as the first woman, the first bride, Eve, is creating from the flesh and blood from the side of the sleeping Adam, so too Jesus, as the new Adam, falls into the sleep of death, and from his side proceed the blood and the water that give life to his bride, the church. Right. So the water, meaning pointing forward to the waters of baptism, by which his bride is washed, and given new life, and then the blood pointing forward to the blood of the Eucharist, which feeds his bride and gives her life and gives her communion with him. So Christ is not just the Messiah, the pierced Messiah, he's also the sleeping Adam. He's the new Adam of the new creation. And then finally, third, and, and in some ways most powerful for me, is the image also of Christ as the new temple. Now this one's a little harder to see unless you know ancient Jewish tradition. Because according to ancient Jewish uh, rabbis, in the traditions known as the Mishnah, there's a treatise in the Mishnah that tells us uh, that during the first century AD, while the temple still stood, the sacrifices were so great and so many in the temple, like during Passover, where Josephus says that they would sacrifice 200,000 lambs in a single day. That's a lot of blood. Uh, the rabbis tell us that because there were so many sacrifices, there had to be a drain underneath the altar so that when the priest would pour out the blood on the altar, the blood of the lamb on the altar in the temple, it would actually drain out 
under the altar and then come out the side of the Temple Mount. For example, the Mishnah, uh, Tractate Midot, chapter 3, verse 2, says this, At the southwest corner of the altar, there were two holes, like two narrow nostrils, by which the blood that was poured over the western base and the southern base used to run down and mingle in the water channel and flow out into the brook Kidron. So the Kidron Valley was to the east of, the, of Jerusalem, between Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives. And so what the mission is describing here is that if you were a Jew in the first century AD and you are approaching the Temple Mount at the time of Passover, say when the sacrifices are being offered, what would you see? You would see a spring of blood and water flowing out of the side of the Temple Mount. So when John sees the blood and the water flowing from the side of Christ, he stops the gospel and says, he who saw it has borne witness, his testimony is true. And he tells you that you might believe. In other words, he's em emphasizing it, I would suggest, because he recognizes a parallel between the body of Jesus and the, and the temple, between the sacrifice of Jesus and the sacrifices in the temple. So just as the blood and the water of the Passover lambs would flow out of the side of the temple mount down from the altar, so too now the blood and the water flows out of the side of Christ who is the true temple in person. Like he says in John chapter 2, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. Right? So Jesus' body is the new temple and therefore it's fitting that the blood and water would flow out of the side of his body, which as the temple is nothing less than the dwelling place of God on earth. That's what the temple was to the Jews, the dwelling place of God on earth and the sole place of sacrifice. Uh, so when you take that model and you really ponder it, it's powerful. Because if you think about it, if Jesus' body is the temple and the side of his body from which the blood and water flows point us to the side of the temple mount, then where is the altar, right? Well, the altar then would be his sacred heart, right? So just as the blood and water flowed from the altar out of the side of the mountain, so now the blood and water that give life to the church flows out of the very heart of Jesus which is, in a sense, the altar of the world, right? And just as St. Peter says, uh, love covers a multitude of sins, so too, the infinite love of God in Christ covers an infinite number of sins. It's not just how much Jesus suffered that makes the cross redemptive. Ultimately, and primarily, it's how much he loved, right? And so when John sees the pierced heart of Christ and the blood and water flowing out, what he sees there is like a visible sign of the love of God for the whole world and of the love of Christ for his bride, the church, to whom he gives life through the blood of the Eucharist and the water of baptism. And I'll end this meditation with a quote from Pope Benedict XVI. If you've never heard this before, if it sounds new, I'm just repeating what many of the ancient Christians and doctors of the church have said. Pope Benedict wrote this on the pure side of Christ. Quote, Benedict said, His death on the cross is love in its most radical form. By contemplating the pierced side of Christ, we can understand the starting point of this encyclical letter. God is love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. It is there that this truth can be contemplated. It is from there that our definition of love must begin. Benedict XVI, God is love, paragraph 12. So what's Pope Benedict saying there? What he's saying is, if you want to know what true love is, just look at the pierced side of Jesus on the cross. And there you will find the mystery of what it really means to say, God is love.